Well, thank you. Well, welcome. Uh, I'm going to make uh, two presentations today. The first one uh, is an award, a fellowship award, to uh, uh, to uh, Atiya Shaw, uh, and uh, it's an award in my father's name, funded through the American Society of uh, Civil, Civil Engineers. We've given this award out uh, since uh, 1998. Actually, the second recipient, Michael, I was wrong, you're the second recipient, not the third. Uh, and it was the 1999-2000 school year that you received it when you were at the University of Texas. Um, but the fellowship goes or will apply to the pursuit of full-time studies in eligible academic graduate programs in highway geometric design, traffic engineering, traffic safety, and transportation planning. So it's relatively, uh, relatively uh, specific. The uh, award, as I mentioned, this year goes to uh, Atiyah uh, here at uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, Atia is the third woman to receive the award out of the total of 12 that have uh, received it. And I hope in the future we'll have more and more women involved. In fact, as I look at the audience here, it's ooh, maybe 40% women. <laughs> so, go gals. If my wife was here, she'd be marching. <laughs> So, but a little background. The selection committee is comprised of three of us. Dr. John Mason, who's chancellor at uh, Penn State um, Harrisburg. Uh, he was previously at Clemson, previously at Penn State, previously at Texas A&M. So, Michael, you know John very, very well. The second person, Wayne Kittleson, who actually has hired several Georgia Tech graduates, uh, one of which uh, received the Jackie Leach Fellowship Award uh, in 2006, Pete Genoir, who now works in the Kittleson uh, Baltimore office. Uh, then there's myself, uh, and I have two advisors. One is my brother, Greg Leach, and the other is Dr. Jennifer Leash, and I really better call her doctor because she has a doctorate degree. So uh, uh, they are our two, our, uh, two advisors. But first, a little bit about Jack Leash. Why an award in his name? So I'm going to talk a little bit about the history and the legacy uh, that he has left to us all uh, today. And I, and actually uh, into the future. First of all, he was an immigrant from Russia in 1921 when he was nine years old. It was after the Russian Revolution. His father was killed during the uh, revolution and it was my grandmother, his mother, and my father that emigrated to the United States. In uh, education, as I initially high school, where he was a star athlete football player, and uh, he held the Maryland State 100-yard dash record. Uh, those, uh, uh, Robert and Michael, who walked around with me, you couldn't tell that my father was fast. <laughs> Once upon a time, I was fast also, but the things have changed. Uh, he got his bachelor's degree at Johns Hopkins in 1935. Uh, it was during the Depression, he couldn't find a job. So what did he do? He went to art school. To pay his way and his living, uh, he actually painted placards uh, for store windows. Uh, that was before there were, there were uh, computers that could produce those, uh, those placards. Finally, in 1936, uh, he uh, got a job, and we'll talk about that in the future, but his further education, uh, he received a master's degree at Waterloo University in, in Canada, actually later on in life. 
Uh, his early career, from 1936 to 56, he was a designer and surveyor for five years on the Skyline Drive and the Blue Ridge Parkway in Virginia and uh, North Carolina. And of course, uh, the Blue Ridge uh, extends into Georgia and Tennessee as part of, part of the Appalachian chain. Uh, then he was moved to Washington uh, and uh, became a designer, one of three, uh, and actually supervised some of the construction of the Pentagon Road Network. Uh, World, World War uh, II had not quite started yet, uh, and uh, the design started and was completed and constructed in a matter of three years. The Pentagon opened in 1942. Uh, he was a contributor and editor of the first two they were called ASHTO, the American Association of State Highway Officials. Now, ASHTO, the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, designed policies in 1954 and 1957. He was also a major contributor to the 1950 Highway uh, Capacity Map. How many of you are taking uh, uh, Dr. Hunter's uh, uh, traffic design course now. Okay, capacity you're going to be talking about, right Michael? Okay. Uh, do you have a copy of the 1950 uh, Highway Capacity Man? Got the 84. <laughs> the 1950 Highway Capacity Manual is about that thick. And if you're really a good traffic engineer, you don't need this three volume set in the software to be able to do capacity analysis and, and design. But uh, <laughs> that was the highway capacity manual <laughs> that we used in my course at Purdue in the early 1960s. So later on, um, from 56 to 91, uh, he left uh, the Bureau of Public Roads, which uh, became the Federal Highway Administration, uh, as a consultant in the U.S., Canada, Israel, Australia, South Africa, and uh, New Zealand. He was also a major contributor to the 1965 and the 1984 Highway Capacity Map. Michael, that's probably the first one you have. I have the whole series, I have the 1950 with all my father's notes in the column <coughs> of what was done wrong. <laughs> he was a visiting professor, already stated by Michael, uh, North, Northwestern, Cal, uh, Waterloo University in, in, in uh, Canada. Uh, awards came along. Along the way, a number of them. Uh, I'm not going to go through the list. I'd like to cite the one at the bottom, however. The Institute of Transportation Engineers named my father as one of the 50 20th century pioneers of uh, transportation. Uh, quite an honor. So what is his legacy? A lot of different things. Father of geometric design, how many people referred to him who knew him. He humanized highway design, incorporating human factors into the development of design criteria, which I'm going to talk about later. He's known as Mr. Interchange, Mr. Capacity. He published more than 50 articles, papers. Uh, he developed design procedures still used today. He trained hundreds of engineers with a context-sensitive design philosophy. Rather unique back uh, 40, 50, 60 years ago. And uh, <laughs> a statement I love that he made. Highway and traffic engineering is an art. It is not a science. He can say that because he had both an engineering degree and an art degree. 
And back in his day, and even in my day when I got started, your hands were used for everything. Your brain and your hands. And the courses that I teach, I teach the participants how to think with a pencil. Not pushing buttons and moving a mouse. Any idiot can do that. <laughs> But the real person that we're talking about, uh, not you, um, uh, previously, uh, a number of degrees, quite a variety. I'm really impressed with the uh, MS in psychology. So, which uh, stands you in good stead for the research that you're doing. Uh, and, uh, a lot of other honors, of course, went along with it. Today, uh, PhD candidate. Uh, she's a member of two TRB uh, committees, and of course, the photograph shows her here speaking at TRB. Was this in one of the sessions, or? Uh... Yeah, this was uh, one of. This was actually um, at an Eisenhower presentation session last uh -huh. year. <laughs> Good. Uh, you're a graduate teaching assistant. You're a member of ASCE. <coughs> uh, are there any ITE members here? Well, you might want to, well, if you haven't, might as well, might as well join ITE also. Uh, member of the Women's Transportation Seminar. And your research, very interestingly, is uh, Behavioral Modeling, Human Factors Engineering, and Engineering Education. And the, uh, this I took out of uh, your essay, actually, that you wrote, uh, which is one of the requirements uh, in the application for the Jack Leach Fellowship. Uh, Adi is motivated by a desire to better understand transportation system users and aims to achieve this through improved measurement of behavior and performance. Or at least she hopes that her work will shed light on how the built environment influences safety, mobility, and quality of life for all system users. So, um, I applaud you. Please come forward. You were a stipend you should have received about three months ago, I think. We won't mention uh, how many millions of dollars it was. <laughs> but, uh, so, congratulations. We'll get some photos after you're done with the photos. Good. Okay. So, would you like to take this back? Oh, we can't keep it. <laughs> so, um, now what I'd like to do is to make a presentation really on um, a topic uh, close to uh, uh, Atiyah's heart, uh, human factors, uh, but actually begin with the guy who started it all. Not necessarily doing the research on human factors, but taking that early research in the 1950s and 60s and translating it into a lot of the design guidelines that we have in our ASCO <coughs> policy, our design policy, or often called, called the Green Book. So I'm gonna go back in the past and gradually move forward and then leave it up to you young people for the future. So, so where do we start and where are we going? I'm only going to talk about freeways and uh, interchanges. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, uh, actually this is on Lakeshore Drive in Chicago, Cloverleaf Interchange constructed in the late 1930s. Lower right-hand corner, 
this is an Israeli's version of uh, what a future interchange might look like. Um, he and I have discussed this at great length. Uh, and I shot it down, but anyway. So here in the United States, uh, the photograph in the upper left-hand corner is the first interchange constructed in the United States, Cloverleaf Interchange, 1928, in Woodbridge, New Jersey. It operated perfectly at the time. Of course, if you look at it, it had no traffic, so that's why it operated <laughs> perfectly at the time. Clover, Cloverleaf is probably one of the worst interchanges from a capacity and a safety standpoint that you could ever construct. It also takes a lot of property. So enough said about that. Lower right-hand corner uh, is a uh, controlled access roadway in the late 1930s in uh, Connecticut. Uh, ornate bridges, very typically at that time. Uh, no protection in relation to the vehicles or drivers hitting uh, the abutments. Uh, they usually were curved. Median was very narrow, as you can see here. Uh, no concrete barrier or even guardrail uh, used down the, uh, down the center, and no shoulders. Uh, from 1936 to 1991, uh, when uh, Human Factors Research started actually in the mid-50s. Um, and human dri uh, driver human factors research was uh, conducted leading to the development of design and operational <laughs> criteria for safer and more efficient freeway and interchange operations. It was Jack Leash, uh, my father, who was the one that developed the foundation philosophy and most of the criteria that appears in the ASHTO design policy and the TAC, that's the Canadian design policy, and I will say also the Israeli, the Australian, the New Zealand, and a number of other countries have adopted uh, those guidelines or those uh, criteria as well in their, in their design uh, policies, <clears throat> applying human factors. So then from 56 to 91, uh, with the human factors research, um, we learned something about driver expectancy. This relates to meeting the driver's anticipation and response to situations along the course of the highway. Here are seven of those uh, that helped establish uh, the design guidelines that are in our ASHTO policy. To remain on a sign route, stay in the left lanes. That a basic lane on a freeway is continuous and will not be dropped at an exit. I'm sure you've all experienced uh, that. There's certainly none here in the uh, Atlanta area. <laughs> when leaving a sign route, move to the right and exit to the right. When transferring to another route on a ramp, there will be a speed reduction. That exits and entrances are on the right. There will be one exit per interchange. How many exits does a cloverleaf have? It has two, doesn't it? Okay. And we have other forms of interchanges that have two. I'll discuss why the single exit for interchange uh, is preferred. At a major fork, go right to go right and left to go left. You don't have a condition here in Atlanta that <laughs> occurs, do you? Yeah, and uh, I'll tell you the reason why the separation of 75 and 85 at uh, at the north end, north attack uh, was designed that way. Uh, there was a, I think it was a steel plant 
that was in one of the quadrants and to avoid the steel plant uh, that's why they reversed everything so you can go right to go left and left to go right. Well, within about three years after the interchange was constructed, the steel plant was torn down. So, uh, and we have a few of those around the, uh, around the country. Oops. Let's start about the first of those, root continuity. If you stay in the left lanes, you'll stay on your assigned route. If you're going to leave your assigned route, you move to the right and you exit to the right. Okay. The diagram in the lower left-hand corner is my father's original hand-sketched version of root continuity. Since it has been digitized and it occurs in our ASHTO policy, essentially exactly like that. There are two different systems that are shown there. One has root continuity and one does not. Uh, in the lower right hand corner is an interchange uh, southwest of Toronto. Uh, Highway 407 in Canada goes from Niagara Falls to uh, Toronto. Uh, and here we have the interchange where uh, Highway 407 or Queens Highway 407 makes, in this case, a left turn through the interchange. But if you're going to either of the other two routes, you exit to the right to go to those, and you also enter on the right of 407 uh, from either of those. So this maintained route continuity. <coughs> Another single exit on the right in advance of the crossroad. We have two different systems that are shown in the lower left hand corner. Okay. The interchanges for each of these are identical in concept, but their modifications in terms of their geometry so that the one on the bottom, every interchange has a single exit in advance of the crossroad. What this does is greatly simplify signing and decision making along the freeway itself at high speeds. So if you have an interchange like a cloverleaf, that's the last one on the lower right. Uh, if you have a two exit design, you need a lot of additional signing on the approach to the interchange to tell the driver the first exit is to go right to wherever, and the second exit is to go left. Of course, you turn right through a loop ramp. And then just to make it a little more interesting, that uh, we have an entry loop that's followed by the exit loop. We have an extremely short lane changing or weaving distance between the two. And that's why the cloverleaf interchange is extremely inefficient and has a very high crash experience. Save rocket science. Uh, also, the advantage of having the single exit in advance of the crossroad is that the driver can see it. In the right hand corner, lower right hand corner, is an example. Every interchange can look, doesn't matter what the configuration of the interchange is, it could be a diamond, a partial clover leaf, uh, any interchange form, that it can look exactly like this as the driver approaches it single exit on the right, the sign frames the exit. Another concept, lane balance. Uh, we apply this at uh, entrances and exits onto and off of the freeway. Uh, that 
what we have found, both through research and also simulation, is that uh, if we have lane balance, that we can reduce lane changing between interchanges. By doing that, we reduce conflicts. By doing that, we improve operations more efficiently and also reduce crashes. And through research, this has been shown. You have a number of examples here uh, of lane balance that are well done. Of course, I did most of the concept design for those, but <laughs> kidding. And, uh, but you also have examples uh, where uh, there is not lane balance. So, again, something that, and this is my father's original drawing uh, of what lane balance is uh, and the equations that are shown there for uh, uh, establishing lane balance either for the exit or for the entrance. And the example uh, on the right side photograph, different interchange, uh, but here we have a two-lane exit. The right lane is what's called an auxiliary lane, uh, where traffic is trapped into the exit, but the adjacent lane is a uh, through or exit lane. Another thing that uh, my father developed was this table in 1971 uh, for uh, ramp spacing. And uh, uh, what he based this on was his understanding of traffic operations, signing requirements, driver perception, reaction, and response time. Uh, and uh, in this table, uh, he had uh, three rows, desirable, adequate, and absolute minimum. This is how it appeared in the 1984 uh, ASHTO policy or Green Book. Uh, ASHTO, in their infinite wisdom, modified it, and only the bottom row, absolute minimum, now shows up in the ASHTO policy. Uh, one of your previous graduate students and award winner of the Jack Leach Fellowship, Pete Genoir, worked uh, with me on the research of ramp spacing, ramp and interchange spacing. And what we found through that uh, research uh, was that what needs to be used is that top row uh, desirable, both for operations and safety. Um, This is interesting. This is sort of the beginning of, if you're doing an interchange study to determine what is the most appropriate interchange at a specific location based on the conditions at that site, this is where you start. And this is my father's uh, original sketch by hand, which appears now digitized in the ASHTO policy. And uh, how he developed this table uh, is it's based on the two interchanging facilities. The location, is it urban, suburban, or rural? Traffic volume, and driver operational characteristics on the crossroad. So here we have cursor work? Yep. So the column on uh, the left 
uh, it's a freeway interchanging either with a local road or a minor street, a primary highway or a major street, or another freeway in a rural, suburban, or urban area. And you see there are different, uh, different basic interchange forms that are in each of the cells of that matrix. And those basic forms are based on just what I described and is written there. It's based on the interchanging facility types, location, <coughs> traffic volume, and driver operational characteristics on the crossroad. If you look at, for instance, here in the Atlanta area, a majority of, oh, how did I do that? Um, if we look at this cell in the matrix, where a freeway interchanges with the major street in a suburban or urban area, there are two basic forms, a diamond and a partial cloverleaf. Anyone care to guess how many, if you combine the two together, how many diamond forms and how many partial cloverleaf forms there are? Anybody want to guess? There are only four that are shown there. There are 29. Whoa. So how do you make a selection? Well. That's another story. You'll have to take my course if you want to find <laughs> So, you know, to my father, this wasn't rocket science. Okay. He understood the human being. Uh, and he assembled this. And he knew everything about interchange planning, design, operations. Well, continuing after my father's death in 1991 up to the present, we're continuing human factors research. We're further developing our traffic operational analysis and simulation software, becoming more sophisticated, more precise, and continuing to be less accurate. I heard someone laugh who obviously understands what I mean by that. So some of you have used the highway capacity software or other simula or simulation software because highway capacity software is not simulation. Uh, and you get very precise numbers. But how accurate is it in relation to what actually goes out on the highway, on the road? Let's say the forecast traffic was for uh, 2,876, not 2,877 or 76, but 77. It could wind up being 2,500, it could be 3,000. Uh, that's what actually happens in the road. But we only use our traffic forecast traffic and whatever analytical software we use for operational analysis to compare alternatives. Not is this is the way exactly this alternative is going to work. It's not. Close, but not exactly. So there's a continuing evolution of geometric design criteria. Uh, new and more efficient, safer interchanges. What would be two of those? Actually, I'm going to show them shortly. Uh, an interchange with roundabout treatment. All right. And how many know of and have driven through here in Atlanta the diverging dive? Okay. Both have shown, certainly the 
diamond or any other interchange form with roundabout treatment operates uh, safer than if we had signalized intersections or stop controlled intersections. And uh, the early research on the divers and diamonds seems to show uh, similar results. Improved signing and pavement marking, better accommodation of pedestrian, bikes, and public transport, except for electric scooters. <laughs> uh, accidents waiting to happen. Uh, new interchange forms, I already mentioned these. Here we have, uh, this is in Carmel, Indiana, uh, north of uh, Indianapolis, uh, with the uh, uh, roundabout treatment, diamond interchange, roundabout treatment. And on the lower right, the first uh, diverging diamond constructed in Canada, in Calgary. Terrific design. I did the design, by the way. Continuing, uh, we're constantly updating uh, things that we use to plan, design, and operate our roadways. The ASTO design policy, development of geometric design software, highway capacity manual, sophisticated, sophisticated variety of traffic operational simulation and 3D software, manual on uniform traffic uh, control devices, and now the highway safety manual, which is in its second um, uh, evolution. And uh, actually, uh, there are several committees of the Transportation Research Board that have been asked to uh, review draft chapters of the highway safety manual, the new one. I'm not going to go through this, but it's something that I developed a few years ago, that if you take all these things that I've been talking about, and you look at if you have them or don't have them, their operation and their uh, influence on safety, uh, that uh, none of the, if you have them, uh, generally, you'll improve operations and have uh, a lower crash rate. If you don't, probably you'll have poor operation and uh, greater safety impact. So the future, today and beyond, continuing crash research relative to freeway and interchange design features. Sophistication in vehicle guidance technology leading to increased capacity and crash reduction on our freeways and interchanges. Further advancements in intelligent transportation systems to increase system capacity and travel reliability. And then based on continuing research, refinement of design criteria to improve operational and safety characteristics of interchanges and freeways, incorporating autonomous vehicles. So, the future is here. Uh, it's not mine, it's yours. So take it. Well, as Bugs Bunny said, said at the end of all of his cartoons, that's all, folks. <laughs> yes, Mike. Please. So the so uh, everybody's going to be down the HOT lanes right now, mm -hmm. but they seem to be leading to a lot of a lot of left-hand exits. Where do you come out? Mm -hmm. Well, left-hand exits for HOV lanes. HOV, HOT, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, uh, uh, that is, you know, operationally is the most efficient way. Uh, here in Atlanta, uh, coming south on 75, um, 
just north of got the name of the crossroad where the interchange is. Uh, and this is probably 20 years ago. Uh, there was a bus carrying uh, uh, a baseball team. Uh, they were in the HOP lane. It was in the middle of the night. Uh, unfortunately, followed the exit onto the exit ramp. Uh, hit the parapet on the bridge on the other side, crossing the roadway went over, uh, everyone was killed. So, uh, in relation to the design of those, you know, whether it's a managed lane, HOV lane, hot lane, whatever you want to call it, that uh, need to be very careful in terms of its design, that it's uh, well designated uh, and it's clear that, uh, that it's an exit. So I don't have a problem with, uh, and uh, here in Atlanta, I designed uh, two. Uh, the one on 75 and 85, just south of 20, and the one that's uh, opposite downtown, uh, the uh, left exits and entrances uh, onto and off of the HOV lanes. So if they're designed properly, in fact, uh, there's been a lot of discussion in the Geometric Design Committee about uh, left side ramps, uh, and we have a number of them. Uh, probably most of them are in conjunction with HOV lanes, but uh, we still have uh, interchanges around the country with, uh, with left hand ramps and uh, exits and entrances. And, uh, there's been a lot of talk and actually a uh, proposal has been written uh, for a research project to look at uh, the design of, of left, left hand ramps not to promote construction of left hand ramps but what can we do to make them safer so not sure I have completely answered your question Michael but, uh, Yes. I just got a new car, and I absolutely love the adaptive cruise control. Mm -hmm. Things like that, do you see uh, adaptive or automatic lane keeping and lane keep assist, adaptive cruise control, having a material impact on freeway design in the future? Uh, probably not until we have uh, fully autonomous vehicles. We had a good discussion yesterday. Um, and I said I was going to ask that question, so I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and for the next, you know, probably for the next 20 or 30 years, uh, we're going to have a mixed fleet. And uh, we will have, uh, you know, vehicles with, uh, you know, all the technology that exists today and over the next 20 years or so. And we'll have some that don't. Uh, the uh, adaptive cruise control I have it on, the, on my vehicle also and I love it <coughs> it drives my wife crazy <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, driving on Interstate 66 going into Washington from where I live uh, you know I put it on the adaptive cruise control and uh, you know, it automatically slows down when I get too close to a vehicle that's going slower than I am in front. And even when it starts to slow down, if there's a gap adjacent to me, I change lanes. And so a real advantage of doing that. And uh, all you have to use is the steering wheel. You don't have to do anything else. But there's a lot of technology that's out there that you would think that we would have already seen a reduction in fatalities on our roadways, but in fact we have. Over the last three years, we've seen a slight uptick in fatalities on our roadways. And the thinking is that primarily has to do with texting and hand holding, like my wife does, hand hold a smartphone and be talking we're looking at ways at the same time. It was interesting when uh, uh, 
Michael, I was waiting for you to uh, pick me up last night uh, at the hotel. I was standing out in front and I was watching drivers go by. Uh, I'd say that one out of every four was either texting, talking on a handheld phone. There was one woman that was putting makeup on and looking in her compact mirror while she was doing it. She wasn't stopped. She was driving. It's illegal in Georgia. Putting your makeup on. So certainly with fully autonomous vehicles, I mean, you can do anything. So. so not sure I answered your question, but there, there are a lot of questions out there that we don't know the answers to. So, any other comments or questions? Yes. David. So, uh, the 400, uh, do you know much about the history of that? It's been a fascinating study to me. They keep widening it. They never widened it enough for the traffic. Maybe that's not the answer. But now they're doing a tremendous amount of construction. I'm just wondering if you had any insights as to what's going on. Well, I know what uh, the 400 uh, 285 road change is going to look like. In fact, has construction started on that yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, it was presented at uh, TRP in a workshop uh, last year, this past year. Um, and, uh, uh, and, of course, the other issues, whether it's 400 and a lot of the other facilities, is that uh, they're going to be uh, barriers separated uh, managed lanes on 285 and how are those going to interface with 400 uh, it's really complicated in how they're going to interface uh, with 75 and 285 with the reversible you know lanes which I actually did the concept design for on 75 running north um, so I haven't been involved in any of it probably for about eight years. So uh, okay. <laughs> wish I could answer your question. <laughs> but uh, by the way, if there are a number of interchanges uh, here in Atlanta that I use in my interchange course. Um, believe it or not, all of them are what to do. That's good. <laughs> Let's see, it's uh, one on, uh, it's the uh, single point diamond on 400, where the MARTA station is. Um, it's uh, the common section of 85 and 285 <coughs> south of the airport. Uh, it's the interchange where 75 and 85 join. I forgot what the roadway is, but uh, uh, where they join north of the airport, 75 and 85. So those are uh, three. There's one on 85 with frontage roads, you know, quite a ways out that I use also. Those are all good ones. Of course, I had to design a pad with them. <laughs> Everything from the 400 to 85 <laughs> southbound. Well, I, actually, I did a study on uh, the whole north rim of 285 from 75 to 85, including 400. Golly, that was probably 20 years ago. And uh, I don't think any of you knew a guy by the name of Kirby Hamill. probably retired, Michael, a couple of years before you came to Tech. And uh, <laughs> with the traffic forecast, we had 450,000 vehicles a day. And uh, how do you accommodate that? <laughs> so, 
so I actually went across section and had uh, 26 lakes. <laughs> <laughs> but it was four roadways. What's going to go on now is there'll be two um, managed lanes outside of the existing lanes. Uh, and in a lot of locations, they'll have to be cantilevered over the existing lanes because of uh, right of way and structures. So, which was also done on 75 North um, with a reversible. And the concept there is uh, the west side was, is constructed first, reversible, with reversible ramps. Uh, and then when and if the directional distribution on 75 significantly changes to closer to like 55-45, that the same thing will be duplicated on the east side. And so you'll have two lanes, managed lanes northbound and two managed lanes southbound. And the big question is, how do you connect all of that to uh, 285. Thank you very much again.